Hi guys and welcome back to the Female Fitness Podcast. I am your host Danny, and today I'm joined by Emma Hindman who is the Posing Pro. Emma, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry yourself as an athlete and then how you ended up getting into posing coaching? Yeah, absolutely. Firstly, thank you so much for having me on. I'm super excited to be here. You're welcome. Um, so how did I um, get into the industry? So I initially was a dancer for 10 years. Uh, went to professional dance school, trained um, in contemporary, moved to New York, danced out there and um, got to the age of about 27. Well, I actually got to the age of about 26 and broke my foot, jumped out of a window randomly and I started to think okay I need a backup what else do I like I like fitness okay I'll get into fitness so got into fitness did my personal training qualification started to work in a gym and the gym that I worked in um there was like there was a, there was quite a community of bodybuilders which is wasn't really that heard of back then it was it was quite an anom anomaly and um my two two of the people that I was surrounded by became really great friends and they were excellent bodybuilders and um, I was inspired by them. I was like, yeah. that's pretty damn cool. Like, I'd love to be able to do that. And um, at the time, there was only really NABA and UKBFF. Yeah. And you were either in, in one camp or the other. And the people who I was surrounded by, they were very much so NABA based. So my, um, my natural progression was to do toned figure. Um, in hindsight, probably should have done bikini because wasn't carrying all that much muscle. Yeah. Um, so did, did NABA, um, did my first show, fully went into it thinking I was going to win. Typical, you know, competitive athlete, um, or always wanted to win, always wanted to be the best. And then I think I got to about two or three weeks out and I kind of realized I'm probably not going to win this. It kind of doesn't work like that. Yeah. And um, at the time as well, there was nothing really, you couldn't really follow someone else's prep. You didn't really know how other people looked. Um, Instagram wasn't, didn't exist. So there was just really Facebook and YouTube and there wasn't really a lot available on there. So um, did my first show <laughs> and had no idea what I was walking into. Um, you know, tan wasn't dark enough, bikini wasn't bling enough, makeup wasn't heavy enough. Um, posing was like, because I danced, I had stage presence. Yeah. And um, I remember being on stage and at that time, the girls that were um, successful and, 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 um, and were inspirational was, was Kelsey Young, who is a big toned figure athlete, um, Charlotte McGill, um, um, oh, I can't think of others, but you know, it, it, they they were they were like they were on point. They've been doing it a few years. They're at the top of their game. So I remember being stood on stage and thinking, oh, they're not doing their quarter turns like me. Oh, I'm just I'm just going to copy them. Um, yeah. so it was like a sponge in the first show. Learned a lot, picked up a lot. Um, and then after that show, I I, I, I was hooked. And I'm one of those people. I have to continue to do something until I master it. Yeah. And, and I don't stop. I don't stop until I do. So from that point on, that was 2013, I literally didn't miss a season for three years. Yeah. I competed every single season. Um, and progressively just got better, picked up different things in each show. Um, slow, like first show I didn't even place. Um, but uh, do you know what? Like, I wasn't bothered. I was, to a certain, I was like, oh. But I realized I was out of my depth and I had yeah. work to do. I wasn't carrying up enough muscle. I didn't look like the other girls. Um, you know, like I said before, the bikini, the tan, the makeup, the overall package wasn't there. Um, so I just got to work on my physique, which we all know now, if you don't take an off season, then it's unlikely that you're gonna grow at a, a, a quicker pace. So. Progression was slow, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to miss the momentum. I yeah. wanted to do every season, um, and, and and I was hooked. So did three. It took me three years to win my first show. So one, um, and I think my my first show that I won was the Naba UK, which ironically was also the first ever show that I stepped foot into, and. Um, did the, won the UK, um, won the, the, the British, which then 
gave him momentum to go and do the Nava Worlds in Brazil. Um, yeah. Which, when you when you go and compete internationally with Nava, you usually get picked. You get asked to go. So usually you win the universe, and you then you go as part of the UK team to compete internationally at the Worlds. I didn't win the universe. That came third. Um, and but then the universe was the season before. So came third at the universe. Then I won the UK and won the British. So I was like, might as well go to Brazil. So funded myself to go to Brazil. Wasn't the cho the chosen one. And then did the worlds in Brazil. Kind of just went and thought, I'll just go and see what happens. You know, it'll be it'll be such an honour to stand on stage with girls of that calibre. Yeah. And even just to place top six would be phenomenal. So um, probably the, uh, looking back now, probably the best tone figure package I've ever brought. Like I was on top of my game then. The posing was on point. The body was really at a point where it was, it, it, it just looked like it was finely tuned and it was at that, at that stage. Um, so on stage, there was another girl from the UK, Natalie McKenna, also great physique. She had come second in the universe and um, was on stage and top six, top five, top four, was thinking, oh, I'm in top three. Fantastic, this is good. And um, third person called out, Natalie McKenna. So there's me and another girl stood on stage. I'm thinking, fucking hell, like I've come second. Oh my God, yeah. this is amazing called out second place and I'm like, I won, I won. The, like completely didn't expect to go there winning. And um, even though in my head, uh, I am one of those people where I, I like to have realistic goals. Yeah. And to me, and also I don't want to say something that I might later disappoint myself with. And to me it was, it was a realistic expectation to be in top six. Top three I'd said would be a dream. And I think because I was so committed at that stage and I had the confidence and the, and the momentum from the other shows, I never at one point thought I was going to win, but I quietly had the confidence that I maybe could. Yeah. And I would be competitive, that I would be competitive for it. Um, so that was quite, quite a switching point mentality-wise for me. Because um, it maybe made you realise like what you were capable of? Yeah, I was like, I, yeah. And, 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 and at that stage, I was like, okay, I've got, finally, I finally got this. Like, it's taken yeah. me a little while, but I finally kind of nailed exactly what I need to do for this category. Um, so then came back to the UK, and that was probably kind of about the time where I started to get into post and coaching, which was really organic. Um, yeah. When I first, even at my first show that I did, even though I didn't place, I won Best Presentation. So... I, I had already gained recognition for posing routines because I danced, like I did backflips on stage, uh, you know, I did the splits, I, I did it all. Yeah. Um, and straight away, other female athletes were asking me to do their routines. Like Rosie Rascal was one of the first people that even came to me before I even competed yeah. to help her with the routine. And then I just started to work with other athletes slowly and... Um, and then as I was working with them on a routine, I was looking at their posing and going, I didn't know anything about it. Like they were bodybuilders, but I was looking at their, at their poses going, oh, maybe if you just try this or, you know, just stick your butt out a little bit more here or, or just put your arm here and it might. Then I started to just kind of build on that as a skill. And um, so, then, so then I had, had a prep client and she was my first prep client. And I said to her, look, I'm going to do your prep. I'm going to do your posing as well, completely free. So I taught her to pose and then I started to gain confidence in that. So I was like, okay, so I've got this, I've got the eye from the dancer. Now I'm starting to really learn and perfect my craft as a tone figure girl. Um, so then that kind of allowed me to lend that to other categories like trained figure and, and, and then started to work with another friend of mine called Gemma and she was doing bikini uk bff so she'd gone to someone else and she said oh if i come to you will you just like spruce me up and give me a bit of sass and i was like yeah absolutely so she came to me and she kind of taught me the footwork of bikini yeah um, and in, in in turn i kind of perfected what she was doing 
So then I started to pick up that as a skill, started to kind of learn bikini. And it just, over time, like, I think when I first started, well, I did it for free. And then I was like, oh, I'll just pay me 20 quid. I'll pay me 30 quid. And then I was personal training and posing coaching kind of started to come on par with the, the level of demand. And I was, I was successful as a PT, fully booked, you know, waiting list. And started to think, I prefer posing. It's more me because it it relates with to the dance more. I can be creative and um and I actually think you know the the scope for this you know there's a demand for it. Yeah. So um started really posing coaching like fifty fifty with PT and then I kind of got to a bit of a crossroads and and I thought same as what I kind of did with dance and PT. I, when I danced, I got to a crossroads where I thought. I'm going to have to go all in with just one of them to make it really successful. I can't continue to do both. Yeah. Um, so that happened with, with PT and posing. And um, I thought, I'm going to have to go with the posing. Like, I enjoy it more. I think there's, it's a niche. There's not as many, there's no one doing it. There's no, there's no posing coaches when I started competing. It yeah. It was an unheard of. Um, and, and then, so I thought, okay, let's do this. So work with, um, I've got like a mindset, a business lifestyle coach called Rob Latte and I had a discussion with him An opportunity came up to get my own studio, uh, which was a big jump because then it was like, okay, outgoings are going to go up. Am I going to, is the, is, is, is the posing business going to catapult? What about if it doesn't? And I'm left with this um, studio to pay for. So I thought, right, okay, let's just do it. I'll take the studio and I'll still continue to PT as well, but I'll kind of push the posing up and slowly start to pull the PT down. So I got some kit in the studio. Um, I had, had I've got like a posing area in there as well. And um, you've been there, so you kind of know what it's yeah. like. Um, so then I was like, okay, if I'm doing this, then I need to brand. I need I need to build a brand so it's you know it, it, I can I can sell it almost. So then the Posen Pro was born, um, got the brand and done and put, put, you know, all of my money like I had into that at the time. I didn't really have savings. Um, and, 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 and then just absolutely went full steam ahead with it. And here we are three years down the line working, got the studio, multiple, multiple locations in the UK, working in Ireland, Vienna, Dubai, um, so yeah yeah it's been so good to see like it's been so good to see your business grow and i think sometimes you almost need that commitment of like getting the studio to go all in on it and you almost feel that pressure to make yourself succeed exactly and it was literally like that is the sink or swim moment in and and I think like you just said, when you decide to make that shift in something, you have to have to make it a success. And you, I think when you do what we do, failing is not an option. I yeah. am not failing at this. So I just worked really, really hard. Like I was in a prep, I'd opened the studio and um, I was still traveling across the country. So I was trying to really build the brand and then compete at the same time and keep my head above water trying to do everything and I literally did nothing but work in the studio do my training twice a day and eat my food do my emails until one o'clock in the morning um, and then get up same thing next day and I literally did that for nine twelve months yeah and I think when you have like a passion for something it allows you to do that it allows you to go absolutely all in on it and spend that much time on it because you love it so yeah. you're able to almost get away with that and you know yeah. that that hard work is going to pay off so eventually yeah. you'll be able to have the downtime that you need to look after yourself and things like that yeah absolutely and it was just like there was there was, there was a lot that I did prior to that to really allow me to get to that place like I um you know and never lived a lavish lifestyle it really took me until I was like 30, 30 years old to really be financially stable. I danced. I danced until I was 27. Dancers don't make a lot of money. So I've always, I've been lucky in the sense I've always done something that I've been passionate about, but I never was really 
secure financially until really the Pose and Pro really got to where it needed to be. Yeah. Um, and there was, I made sacrifice. Like I didn't drive until I was 30. I lived in shared houses, you know, I didn't, I didn't go on big holidays. So I couldn't afford it and everything. And even when I danced, I danced, I taught classes and, um, you know, I worked extra jobs. I've, all, I've always had that mindset, you know, always wanted to be self-sufficient, have my own money. But at the same time, I didn't, I didn't really fall on something or maybe it was time and where I could really, really cultivate it and make it a big success. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And one of the questions, actually, one of the girls on Instagram asked, you mentioned you prepped someone previously, prepped a few people, I know you did. Yeah. Um, would you ever consider doing that again? Or are you like fully invested in the Posing Pro and just doing that sort of thing? Um, do you know what? I'm going to be totally honest. Like, I don't really enjoy prep. <laughs> yeah. I and I did it. I did it because I knew I, I, knew I was good at it. I knew I could do it. Um, but... My my real passion it's posing and and that and and the posing pro um and I I enjoy I enjoy I enjoy the process hate writing programs hate changing writing nutrition plans to me it's time consuming and I got to a point where again I was prepping people I was so when I moved into the studio I was I, I prepped about. Only like maybe five girls at a time, but can't you know yourself? Like prep is 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 full on. Yes. So combine that with PT. Combine that with posing, coaching, answering emails, trying to build a website, prepping myself at the same time. Um, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the the, the progress of the girls and. I, like if they could come to me, which is I have one prep client now, and I, I have one because you know she I, I can't I, I can't find it in me to let her go because we we're at a stage now where she's got all the plans, she's got all the nutrition. We're into our third prep together, and she can I have a I have a um, a deal set up where she comes to the studio, we do pose in, we sit down, we talk about her plans, yeah. and I'll say okay, we need to work on this area. I want you to add this exercise in to the programs that we've already got. And that's how we work now. Yeah. Now, I could do that with every single client and just say, here you go, this is what you need to do, off you pop. I would prep, but we both know that people need spoon feeding. Yeah, definitely. When, when they're being prepped. And that's just not, as I said, writing the plans um, and you know the, the training plans, the, the nutrition plans, it didn't become cost effective for me. Yeah. And like I said, I think everything happens for a reason. And there's probably a reason that PT didn't take off for you in the same way that posing has, because mm -hmm. posing was what you were meant to do, if that makes sense. And yeah, absolutely. But I also find as well, like in regards to personal training at the time, there wasn't really online coaching wasn't a thing. Yeah. And I got, to, I got to my cap. I got to the point of where I was charging £45 an hour, which is, which is top end for a PT in my area. And I couldn't really push it any higher because people just wouldn't pay it any really any more than that. And I, and it was either, you know, I've got friends that have taken PT to the next level and opened their own PT studio, but didn't really want that. Yeah. You know, would it be nice to have my own gym, which, um, which now I actually have, so that's another topic. Um, but I... It, it, like you say, was it's not my passion. I, my passion has been in the studio. It's been creative. It's you know teaching people my skill. That's that's what I get. Um, that's what I get more out of. Yeah, and you've now you've now branched out and on your website you've got the posing tutorials and you also do in yeah. Skype and you've got one to one. Yeah. What would you recommend someone start with as someone who's brand new to posing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The tutorial, and that's why I devised them. So. Um, the tutorials are there's a, there's a few purposes to them and the first one is that you know people can learn the correct basics and fundamentals for their category from a reliable source because what i started to find was that people were coming to me and they had really bad habits and they'd either learn from someone else incorrectly 
or they had learned from YouTube and it, it again, it was incorrect. So they had these bad habits or they would have just been taught wrong. And I just kind of thought, if I can, um, if I can build a service where people can learn what I'm teaching, what I deem to be correct, um, and they want to come to me anyway, then it kind of cuts out because I was having to unpick what they'd already learned in the studio, which for me is, is wasting their time. I want someone to come in and I want to keep, I want to move them forward and progress them. So for me to undo what they've already learned incorrectly, it's wasting time. Like I want you guys to learn know what you need to know, get you to a place where, you know, you're, you're almost able to fly the nest. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I, it, with what I do, it's, it shouldn't be, it, it, unless you're competing as, as a career, I should maybe see you, um, we get to a point where it's like it's once a month. And then yeah. after that, I only really see you when maybe you're four weeks out from your show and we're just tweaking and fine tuning, um, and, and it, we're working on that level. Um, so there's that reason I wanted to make beginners be able to have a platform where it was um, a trustworthy source. And also um, I wanted to provide a service that was more accessible to people that maybe didn't have the money for a one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Um, because, you know, for the past year, I think my prices have been top end. So it, I'm not cheap. And I'm the first one to admit that, but I think my price reflects my skill and my service, um, which isn't always, people aren't always able to access that, you know? So that was another reason why I built the tutorials. I mean, you can get level one and two for 50 quid and that's, you know, that would be the equivalent of a 30 minute Skype, one 30 minute Skype, you know? So there's that side of it as well. So if you are a beginner, start with the online tutorial. Yeah. Um, level one and there's there's level one for every category now um and then once you've done that then i recommend that then you do a one-to-one -one. and then usually after the one-to-one -one, you know you, we've either covered what's in level two or if we really had to perfect what's in level one then you can go on to level two um and then also now we've got the the four week online course yeah which is something i've just devised and uh, which i actually think that's going to end up being my most effective um training platform yeah because i've never done anything like this before and it's it's a four week course and um you know the, the athletes have a specific video platform there's there's a, a, a group chat they check in with me week to week so usually, you know, there might be like, you, I tend to find that one-to-one -one clients that see me face-to-face, -face, we usually see each other like three to four weeks. And I think that seeing me weekly, like one week will be a video check-in and I'll give feedback. The other week will be a face, um, a Skype session. So they're getting that one-to-one -one and they're getting that constant accountability. Yeah. Which means that, because what happens is we tend to correct something and we do it in a session. And then slowly what I found is, is that when the time passes, clients tend to regress and they slip back into old habits because the body and the brain does that without even realizing it. It wants to do what feels most comfortable and what's most easiest. Um, and I think with this process, people will rectify their issues and I think they'll progress quite a lot quicker so we'll see what happens with it so but um, i'm excited so yeah. that's, a, that's a new a new platform as well when i saw it i thought it was a great idea actually and it's a bit like coach online coaching in that yeah. it provides that accountability yes so people yeah. know that they're going to have a check-in with you so they're going to be practicing yeah. before that check-in yeah yeah and then essentially by the end of the four weeks they should really have gone through the course and practiced so much that they it is then ingrained in them yeah yeah. You know, because I, I find as well that people practice, but when they practice, they tend to really just kind of make the shapes and go through the, the motions as opposed to really getting into the nitty gritty of it, breaking it down and understanding the mechanics of it and the setup and how, how you know, certain parts, you know, affect other body parts. So um, 
and as that's just that's just because it's not people's craft it's my yeah. craft like i'm obsessed with it and i want to break it down and get into it so i think having that from me will also almost teach them how to practice properly yeah i completely agree and i agree that people don't practice properly as well like sometimes i'll have clients and they obviously check in every week so they go through their poses every single week but then they'll go to a posing session and they'll say how much they hurt from that posing session and that just shows me that they aren't posing properly in those yeah. pictures because otherwise yeah. they wouldn't get so sore after a posing mm. session because mm. they'd be doing it mm. frequently anyway exactly exactly so i just yeah and i think it's exactly that like um at some unless it's like training people think they're training hard yeah and then they go and train with a coach and they can't walk the next day you're not training hard enough yeah exactly yeah, you're not posing hard enough you knew so i think some people um, i think sometimes we can underestimate what we can actually do um and sometimes you need someone to push you there or take you there and then you can go ah, okay yeah i can work a little bit harder yeah, I completely agree on that. And when would you recommend someone start posing who is thinking about competing? Obviously, I know the answer to this, but someone has asked this question. As soon as you decide you're going to compete, then you start posing. Yeah. It's a craft. It's like, would you decide to compete and not start going to the gym? Would you decide to compete and not adapt your food? You yeah. know, it's exactly the same thing. And, and really like the posing, it's the most crucial part, really. Obviously the physique is and you know, the full package, but if you've got a great physique and I've seen it 10 times over, if you've got a great physique and you cannot showcase that on stage, you might as well not bother because you're not going to get the place that you deserve. Yeah. You know? Time and time and again, I've seen people like someone with a slightly less conditioned physique might place yeah. first because they've yeah. nailed their posing yeah. and they're just exactly. so impressive when they get yeah. on stage exactly exactly and i always say to someone imagine there's you and there's another girl on stage you are pretty much identical in physique yeah there's not much between you physique wise the girl next to you hitting her angles she can present well she's eye-catching she's got presentation who are they going to go with? Yeah. The girl next to you. And that's what you need to think. Exactly. Um, but also I think as well, that comes down to mindset and, um, and something, you know, I've talked about in the past, like champion mindset and how much do you really want it? Yeah. Um, I think, again, that's another area that people really need to tap into because I think some people think they want it and they actually maybe don't because they're not going excuse the term, balls deep on everything. Yeah. Um, and I think, but then I think, you know what, there's a, there's a place for everyone because the people that want to go all in, they are the people that they win, they become pros, they want to make a career out of it. Yeah. I think there's a sliding scale and some people end up getting into competing maybe because they're quite motivated by how glamorous it looks, the end product. Whereas mm -hmm. other people, they are all in on bodybuilding as a whole and yeah. they want to achieve their true potential. And those yeah. people are the people that nail their posing. They nail every yeah. little intricate detail. I, I know those people as soon as they step foot in my studio. Yeah. They're the ones that come to me a year before they step on stage. And they're the ones that I'm seeing every single month for a year, sometimes more than that. And when we get into, you know, those, those final four weeks, there I'm seeing them regular. I'm seeing them a week before their show. We're making changes. For example, um, Jody uh, Delonde started with me um, a year before her show. Posing was not great at all. And she'll, yeah. she'll, she'll agree with that. She worked so hard and I remember we, her front pose, all the way through her prep, I was like, oh, that's not a good angle for you. It's not that flattering, you know, keep practicing it. Keep practicing it because we never know it might come into play. Um, and we had an alternative front pose, which we were utilizing for PCA. The week before her show, we had a posing session in, um, in Birmingham. And I said to her, show me that front pose. And I said, it needs to go back in. Yeah. 
do you know so that's that's an example um you know i could i could give you i could give you a couple um and that they're the, they're the ones she went on she won yeah you know like she would she won her regional and she's she's got that mindset but you've got to be able to tap into that mindset yeah definitely and how long would you recommend someone practice posing one through their prep and then two through their improvement season phases yeah so okay so your prep i say for example you're starting at 16 weeks out you should be practicing your um your posing i'd probably say like three times a week yeah. And then as you progress through your, and it depends because everyone's on different levels. You know, if you've got a lot, I'm, I'm of, the, of the mindset, if I'm not good at something, I'm practicing it until it becomes second nature. If your posing practice is alien to you or it feels awkward or you're not getting something, you should be practicing that shit every day. Yeah. You know, so if your posing is better and say, for example, you are an experienced athlete, you should be r running it regular but you should be critiquing yourself. So it might not be a case of, you know, you're running it every single day, but you're watching yourself back. And what, what I think athletes need to learn to do is train their eye. Yeah. So they can look at, look at a video and go, mm, okay, that's a bit off. Oh, did I miss that checkpoint? Shit. Okay. Yeah, I did. So I need to go back over that and think, you know, so it's thinking about it on different levels. So, um, so during your prep, you know, I think if you've got work to do, you need to be working daily on it. If you are just perfecting and working through it, you know, three, four times a week and get the work done before you get to a stage of where you are tired from prep. So get the bulk of the work done early on as early as poss possible. Um, really by the point of being eight weeks out, you should be running your quarters daily. I mean, when I, when I was in prep, um, Luckily, I checked it out. We got to the stage eight weeks out and I was, I was checking in daily with Jordan. Um, and it, it actually taught me that running my, running my compulsories daily actually really, really helped because it was just ingrained in me and, and I really was able to pull things apart. And, you know, I'd, I'd spend 20 minutes pretty much every morning running something and looking at it and going, nah, it still doesn't look right. Oh, I need to just tweak that. Let me just work on that. Um, and that definitely, definitely paid off. If you're in your off season um, and you're just learning for the first time, you need to be practicing regular enough to get it in there. The quicker you get it, the, 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 the less work you've got to do later on. Yeah, I completely agree. Now. And I you think know, so. I think nailing it earlier on in a prep is so beneficial because you know how absolutely battered you are at the end of prep. So if you can yeah. nail posing earlier, it's just going to make that back end of prep easier and less stressful. Yeah, you're taking that element out, you know. So it is it's 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 something you don't need to stress about if you get it nailed at the very beginning. And say, for example, you you decide to compete and you start your posing a year ahead of when you get on stage. Yeah, you're, you're fucked at one week out, but we're just fine tuning. Yeah. You know, we're going, okay, let me just tweak that. Okay, let me just see this. Okay, now just run the whole thing. You know, at, when, when you're four weeks out, I want to be at a stage where we're just running the full thing. You're, so when you step on stage, you're, you're not thinking about, oh, what's that, what's that checkpoint to the front? you're just running it effortlessly on stage you're walking on stage like yeah you're like an amazonian do you know you're you're bringing that full package so you're you're actually able to present yeah and showcase yourself instead of getting in getting into a side pose and then you know, wriggling around in it into in, in, until it feels like it's correct like you want to pre be presenting as perfectly as possible from the moment you step on stage yeah and in terms of methods of practicing your posing do you generally think that recording yourself and then watching it back is a good method to utilize absolutely i think initially what i tend to advise is that you start in the mirror because you need to be able to see what you're doing you need to train your eyes see the shapes um and i think once you get to a stage where you 
don't necessarily need the mirror. You need to start recording, watch it back, even if you've still got the mirror there, and um, critique yourself. Because sometimes what tends to happen is we become reliant upon the mirror to see it. Whereas what we need to remember is there's no mirror on stage. So this is where we need to feel it. You need, you need to feel how I always say to people like hit it, hold it, feel it. How does it feel? Where are your points of tension? Do you know where your right foot is exactly? Do you know how your shoulders and your lats feels? Do where's your arm position? Are your arms too high? Are they too low? Um, and you, that, that is something you need to feel. But I think all of the aspects, the mirror, recording and watching, and then eventually at four weeks out, you should be using no mirror. You should be recording, watching back, critiquing, going again. Critique, yeah. go again. Got something wrong, go again. Um, so initially mirror, then mirror and video, and then just video and critique. Yeah. And when it comes to posing and what you've seen people present on stage, what do you think the most common mistakes in bikini and figure are? Most common mistake. I think in bikini, the most common mistake would probably be um, the front at the front pose and the flapping of the arms, trying to flare the lats and use the flank, trying to flare the lats by flapping the arms around. Um, or, you know, just over flexing in the knees. So you end up looking like a dead fly or something, you know, um, that, but that, that, that is just, that's, it's almost like a case of monkey see, monkey do, you yeah. know, we watch and I've had other girls go to me, oh, I, I know, I go, what are you doing with your arms? Where has that come from? And they go, oh, do you know what? I've been watching so much on social media and I've just accidentally picked it up. So that's why I try and teach like, there, there's a reason for everything. Yeah. Why are your arms up that high? You tell me why your arms are flapping around here. They don't know. They don't know. Okay, so talk me through the fundamentals. How do we flare the lats? Do we flare the lats by moving the arms? No. So why are your arms that high? Well, that's where they need to be to scoop the lats out. No, they don't because the mechanics of the lats are, the lats just move from here to here. Yeah. You don't need to move your arms for that. So that's probably the most common one for bikini. Um, for figure, to be honest, it's probably the same two things that are replicated in both categories. Flaring the lats incorrectly. Um, and probably as well from the rear, squeezing the lats together. Yeah. Because we want to feel it. You want to feel the tension. So you tend to find as well, people haven't recorded and they haven't watched themselves back doing the rear pose. So they just end up thinking, oh, I squeeze the lats together and that feels like the lats are engaged. Well, I'm from the back. The judges want to see the muscles in the back, don't they? So usually that, um, and they add, yeah, they're probably the, the main, the main yeah. two issues. I agree with that. And I think that everything can become really exaggerated on stage as well. So if someone's doing something on like a minor scale when yeah. they're posing in practice, the studio. it can yeah. just become so exaggerated. Yeah. And that's what I say to people as well. I usually say like, cause a lot of people say to me, um, when I, when I teach them, the first thing I usually do when I'm teaching someone, say for example, the bikini front pose, um, I say, keep your arms down, move your lats, keep your arms down. And they go, but, uh, 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 but, but the girls on stage, like their arms, they're, they're, they're high. And I'm like, yeah, but, what you need to remember is whatever you do in the studio, expect it to be exaggerated tenfold on stage because yeah. you've got excitement, adrenaline, nerves. You're not and, and, and you're not experienced. So you're not experienced enough to internalize that. Yeah. Like luckily, I, I've got I've got experience of being on stage. So I'm quite good at bam, I'm in the moment. I'm smiling and I'm performing, but internally I'm thinking bam, hit this, right, okay, I'm strategic on stage. Um, and a lot of people, they don't have that because it's not, it's not, some, it's not a skill that they have. Um, yeah. So you do, I, and, and, and that's, as I was saying, I almost force my athletes to keep the arms down and straight because I know if I teach them that fundamental, once we've got those basics and fundamentals nailed, 
then add your presentation and your stats. Yeah. Um, and even then, you know, if I get, if I'm working with someone and they come back in the studio and the arms are prepped up, get your arms down. Why are they that high? They don't need to be that high. And like you just said, they'll get higher and higher on stage. Yeah. If you flex your knees a little bit too much in the studio, I guarantee you, you're going to be bending at the knee on stage. Yeah. So, um, and, and I, I do tend to say that quite often in the studio, like whatever you do in here is going to be exaggerated. So if I pull you back a little bit more than you need to be pulled back, it's going to, you're probably just going to hit the right level on stage. Yeah, definitely. And so I usually recommend that people come to you, but say someone wasn't able to get booked in with you for whatever reason, what would you generally recommend looking for if someone's looking for a posing coach? Um, someone who has a good track record um, from other athletes, you know, um, and, a, and a track record, I mean like um, a good amount of athletes and they're working with a lot of athletes that they look great. I think sometimes what can happen is the, the, the posing coach can be great at posing and they're great at posing, but there's, you have to be able to teach. And I think yeah. that's one of the reasons why I am successful at this because, because I've got a, a strong teaching background from working with, beginners to, to to professional dancers I I can switch my ability yeah you know to, and, and it's really is a case of learning how to break it down how does someone learn okay this isn't working for them let me try something else and having the confidence and the expertise to do that um so yeah if you're looking if you're looking elsewhere track record yeah that makes complete sense. And since lockdown, so you've been doing a lot of Skype sessions. How have they been going? And have you found them as effective as one-to-one -one sessions? Yeah. Yes and yes. Um, so I was doing Skype prior to, to lockdown anyway, because a lot of my international clients, we work via Skype. Um, and I know it works. Um, the difference is, so there's, there's, there's two... There's benefits to each side of it. Obviously, with the studio, you you get the face-to-face -face, um, environment um, and experience. But what happens, what I now have actually found, that in the studio, I'm able to spoon-feed a lot more. Yeah. So say, for example, someone is struggling to flare the lats. I'll just move the lats for them in a hope that they can then feel it and start to do it themselves. Now... In a Skype session, I have to break it down for you in several different ways sometimes so that you get it, yeah. so you understand how to do it. So I actually think that that is a, a better tool and a skill for the athlete because yeah. then you, instead of you being caught up in the studio, and I tend to find in the studio that because I am so hands-on, it almost, the, the, the athlete almost becomes complacent. Yeah. Or not lazy, because obviously I'm dictating the session, but they, they oh, Emma, I can't play my lats. If I could just take you on stage with me. Whereas with a Skype session, I cannot, I'm the kind of person, like, I can't move on from something until I feel like someone's got it, because that's the teacher in me. Yeah. So some of the Skype sessions, we might not cover as much, we might not, you know, get past the quarter turns and onto the transitions, but trust me not, you will understand a lot more of what you're doing, you, because you have to set it up yourself. Yeah. And if you are struggling with the lats, we'll, I'll spend a whole freaking session you will learn how to flare your lats before we finish that Skype session. And I think as well, in the Skype session, because, because I want someone to nail something, I give them even more tips and tools to go away with. So I'll say to them, okay, you're sticking on, on this left lap for some reason. I recommend that you go, you do some um, myofascial release or you need to do some stretching or you need to do some strengthening, you need to do mobility work. Um, so I, the studio sessions are great 
but I actually think that as well for Skype also, you'll know yourself, you don't, we critique together. Yeah. So whereas in the studio, say for example, you're in a side pose and I, I can see you're not doing it properly. I just say to you, right, no, just lift this, flip, give me more lat. I can see immediate look, it looks better. But in the Skype session, we together, because how our work is take a picture before, take a picture after, we can look in at the pictures together and I can go, right, can you see the difference? Yeah. And then the athlete goes, oh, right, okay, yeah. Whereas in the studio session, because maybe we move a little bit quicker and I can, I can adapt you and I can see what's right and wrong. Whereas in the Skype, actually, you learn what's right and wrong. So essentially that should aid you and and your your skill yeah and i can vouch for the fact that they're effective because obviously i've had skype sessions myself mm -hmm. and also i've had clients come and see you for a skype session and they've all been really pleasantly surprised yeah and their Everyone person has, has improved been. yeah and i think as well like obviously because my my business is so studio based and you know that's that's what people expect that's, they just want a studio session. So most people, if they can pick between studio and Skype, they're going to go with studio. Yeah. Um, and 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 that's that's a that's just a level of expectation and maybe a little bit of entitlement. I don't know. Um, so this the, yeah, this there's, there's, there's a huge huge place for the Skypes. I think I think once once you get to a certain stage where you know we've really mastered it. Um, and we're maybe then looking more at, you know, the walk and the presentation and the full run of it. I think that's then when we kind of definitely need the studio. Yeah. But in the same breath, my international clients, they don't have that, um, they don't have that luxury, you know, like when I was, when I was prepping for figure, um, I worked with um, a coach in America for posing because it was new to me and I wanted to master it. Um, and it was Skype or it was nothing. So yeah. I didn't have an alternative, you know? So I think because people have the option of the studio, they think they want the studio session, but I actually think that people, they learn more in a Skype. Yeah, I also think it's a, an element of comfort as well. Like people always gravitate to what they're used to and trying yes. something new is like out of their comfort zone. So it just takes yeah. actually trying that and realizing yeah. that actually, you know, this really works and it is yes. really beneficial yeah. to yeah. sort of get them used to it. Yeah, I've actually as well, like, because obviously a lot of the sessions, all of the sessions switched from studio to Skype. Um, I almost had to kind of slightly enforce it yeah. because I knew that people would be like, I don't want a Skype, I want a studio. But I was so confident about the Skype session that I literally said to some people, do the Skype, and if you're not happy after the Skype, I will happily some way, um, you know, reimburse you or, or give you, a, I'll give you a free, I'll give you a free studio session when yeah. we're able to. And 100% of the people after the, after the Skype session, they're literally like, oh my God, that was so good. I walked away with so much, like I learned so much. It was so beneficial. Every, everyone's been pleasantly surprised, which is nice. Um, uh, and it gives me the confidence in my skill and I actually think because of this situation my skills improved on Skype because yeah. I've had to adapt even more so um it's fun it's uh, yeah it just gives me it gives me another level and another tool yeah definitely so as a last question what are your goals and where do you what is your vision for your business Okay, so what is the vision for the business? Um, I want to work with as many people as possible um, internationally. That's that's the next goal. Um, obviously, we've ticked off Europe and Dubai. I'd, I'd, I'd like the end goal would be to to work at the top as yeah. as well as you know people that are coming into the sport. I'd like to work. Had the opportunity to work with some really really great pros. Um, you know, Rosie Rascal, um, you know, Korean I've worked with, um, Jamie Johal, um, you know, a lot of figure pros, the girls that turned figure this this um, last season, um, and I'll continue to work with them. So 
And I really, I get, I get a lot out of both aspects of it, but the pros, that's where you, that, they're pros, so they're obsessed with it as well. Yeah. Um, like one person that pops into my head, um, Scarlett. Yeah. Um, and because be, she, because she's a dancer as well, and so obsessed with the craft and the skill, like we were getting into the nitty gritty of the studio and work, and like, she was like, she was fine tuning certain points, and I would go try this tweak that and we were literally I was literally like oh my god that's amazing you know I get a lot out of that because it's just working on another level and, and it is a fine art yeah um uh so totally digress there um so the end the goal the goal is to you know work at the top um really build a model that can service as many people as possible um and i am um, i'm gonna the next goal is i am taking over a gym so that is the next thing which is gonna um it'll be open and ready for when all of this is over which is exciting so my studio will be in there as well so new premises for the studio all singing all dancing lighting floor and everything um and legacy leave a legacy yeah. uh, I, 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 i'm not and i don't think this is big headed to say this but i want to be known internationally as the most reputable posing coach out there yeah. you know um i'm obsessed with my my craft i'm passionate about it i'm always learning um, i'm always progressing and um i just want to really be known for that yeah and to help as many people as possible. That makes sense. And it makes complete sense you wanting to work with, you know, top level pros and things like that, because it allows you to use all of the skills that you have acquired as opposed yeah. to just the basic level. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when um when I was over in Dubai and I was working with Jamie, um, it becomes it becomes then when you work with a pro, it becomes a collaboration yeah because because they're they're confident in what they do and they know what works for them and i'm confident in what i do and what i know to go like so, so jamie's re, re one of his reposers was um i just said to him just try this on the legs let's just see what it looks like and uh and and it transformed the you know the overall um pose and when you can work with like that with someone it's 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 super creative so you get i get so much out of that um so i'd like to do more of that and i think as well like with the pros the ones that are already top end you know we're talking olympia and doing all of you you know the ifbb pro pro shows you you kind of got to be on their radar yeah. you know and um i'm uh, obviously like i'm well known in the uk within beginners amateurs people who want to become pros and are turning pros obviously i'm working with them and that's great but i need to get to that top level yeah. and that's a goal you know yeah. like i want you know i've been um that is the goal yeah i i, I want the pros to go i want to work with emma hindman yeah and that's, that's an incredible goal. So Emma, where can people find <laughs> you on socials and what is your website as well? Yeah, so socials are on Instagram. We've got at Emma Heinemann underscore the Posen Pro. Um, the website is www.theposenpro.com. Um, what else have we got? I've got private Telegram groups where you can join so you can get um, regular updates. And there's even a, a chat group where, where you can join and I'll just send free tips and information in there. If you want to ask questions in there, that's accessible. Uh, and then we've also got YouTube, which is just the Pose and Pro. Um, I'm building more content on there as much as possible. And lastly, Facebook, which is just uh, Emma Heinemann, the Pose and Pro. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us today, Emma. It's been amazing to have you on the podcast. And thank you. Thank you for listening, guys.